Bonjour, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Mesdames et Messieurs, Dear Friends and uh, Colleagues, I'm, I'm Benjamin Haute-Couverture from the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique à Paris. Let me first thank Ettore Greco, of course, and his team and uh, Federica for giving me uh, this opportunity to moderate this uh, special session with uh, Director General Fernando Arias for a keynote speech on an issue that is now absolutely critical for the uh, entire international uh, non-proliferation and disarmament order. <clears throat> the norm of uh, prohibition of chemical weapons, of which, of course, the uh, organization of all the prohibition of the chemical weapons, the OPCW in The Hague, is one of the main warranters. And uh, as High Representative Borrell pointed out in his uh, introductory remarks yesterday, the universal norm prohibiting chemical weapons, as we know, has come under attack in recent years. Chemical weapons uses, the related issue of attribution, naturally, accountability for breaking the norm inter alia. And for the EU, uh, support for the OPCW is a tangible sign of its support for effective multilateralism since 2003 now. And it clearly means that any attack <clears throat> on the authority of the CWC is therefore an attack on the EU's strategy and on the European security interests. And uh, against that uh, serious backdrop, which in my opinion deserves to be uh, recalled in these logical European terms, there are of course other challenges the OPCW has to face. The challenge uh, of the post-destruction phase, uh, the universality of the treaty, uh, science and technology and cooperation and uh, on, on peaceful uses and so on. Uh, Director General, uh, we are very honored to have you uh, amongst us uh, today. For those who are not uh, very familiar with uh, this uh, uh, issue of uh, chemical uh, we weapons uh, uh, prohibition, the OPCW Director General is the representative of the OPCW's member states and the highest authority in the Technical Secretariat. Ambassador, uh, you were appointed Director General of the OPCW in December 2017 now by the Conference of States Parties. And uh, prior to this position, you were Ambassador of Spain uh, to the Kingdom of the Netherlands and permanent representative of Spain to the OPCW already at that time from 2014 to 2018. So uh, now the floor is yours, sir, for uh, approximately 15 minutes speech, which will be followed by a, a Q&A session with our audience. Uh, I will have the, the pleasure to, to moderate. Ambassador, your turn. Merci bien, Monsieur le Président. Excellencies, uh, Jane, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, at the outset, I wish to thank the Instituto Affare Internationale for organizing this conference on behalf of the European Union Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium. The OPCW and the European Union have enjoyed a close and collaborative partnership for many years. And I commend the European Union for its sponsorship of this event. I will come this opportunity to meet uh, with prominent uh, leaders and friends in disarmament, non-proliferation and international security. This is a critical time in our field. The situation regarding the international non-proliferation and disarmament regime is really worrying. The successfully intermediate range nuclear forces treaty was suspended in 2019. The strategic arms reduction treaty started too, has not entered into force. The anti-ballistic uh, missile treaty 
was terminated in 2002. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, opened for signature in 1996, has not entered into force, uh, and additionally, its founding principle may be under threat unless there is a change in the positions of some countries. The Treaty of Open Skies that has brought important benefits during the last 18 years will come to an end very soon if something is not done on time. With the Biological Weapons Convention, progress has certainly been made by its 193 states parties. However, the challenges of its effective implementation remain clear. So clear that the convention was never granted an organization in charge to implement it. In this context, we realize with concern that the international recognized legal structure that underpins the global non-proliferation and disarmament architecture is under real threat. Against this backdrop, the Chemical Weapons Convention remains a unique uh, treaty as it embodies a total unverifiable ban on an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. In 1997, the convention entered into force, codifying the international community's commitment to eliminating chemical weapons. Its goal is much, is much more ambitious than non proliferation. Its aim is absolute. We work for complete elimination, total destruction of chemical weapons, vigilance against re-emergence, zero tolerance. During the last 23 years, the Convention and the OPCW have delivered concrete and durable results. With 193 states parties, the treaty covers 98% of the global population. Over 98% of 72,000 tons of declared chemical weapons stockpiles have been already verified by the state, by the Secretariat of the OPCW as destroyed. And the remaining fraction is on track to be destroyed by 2023. In recognition of the OPCW's extensive efforts to eliminate chemical weapons, the organization received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2013. What has been achieved under the convention in little over two decades is a significant and tangible contribution to international disarmament. Regrettably, although remarkable progress has been made, many challenges remain. In recent years, there have been a number of cases of confirmed chemical weapons use. Since 2012, since 2012 chemical weapons have been used in Iraq, Malaysia, the Syrian Arab Republic, and the United Kingdom. The recent event involving the use of a toxic chemical as a weapon on the territory of the Russian Federation is also a cause of concern. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2020, the OPCW entered its seventh year of engagement in the Syrian Arab Republic. However, today, many concerns persist regarding the initial chemical weapons dossier. First, Syria's initial declaration submitted in 2013 remains incomplete. An OPCW declaration assessment team was established in 2014 to address the concerns of the international community in this regard. Over the years, the declaration assessment team has brought Syria to amend its initial declaration many times. Despite these amendments, many questions remain unanswered. Overall, the information provided thus far by the Syrian Arab Republic does not enable the Secretariat of the OPCW to resolve the identified 
gaps, inconsistencies, and discrepancies in the serious initial declaration of their chemical weapons. The second issue of concern is related to the repeated allegations of chemical weapons use on the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic. To address these uh, concerns, the fact-finding mission was established in 2014 in the OPCW. To date, the fact-finding mission has investigated 77 allegations of chemical weapons use and determined 18 events of likely or confirmed use in Syria. In June 2018, the conference of the states parties of the OPCW decided to address the persistent threat of such use by identifying the perpetrators. In compliance with this decision, the investigation and identification team was established to identify the perpetrators of chemical weapons use in Syria. On April 2020, the Secretariat of the OPCW released the first report of the IIT concerning three of the nine cases the IIT has been investigating. The report concluded that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the perpetrators used the chemical weapons in Latamina on three occasions, on the 24th, 25th, and 30th of March, 2017. Sarin was used in two occasions, and chlorine was used in one. And the IIT identified individuals belonging to the Syrian Arab Republic Air Force as the perpetrators. Following the assurance of the IIT report, the Executive Council of the organization decided last July to request the Syrian Arab Republic to declare to the Secretariat of the organization, the chemical weapons used on the 24th, 25th, and 30th of March 2017 attack I referred to. Syria is also requested to declare all the chemical weapons it currently possesses, chemical weapons production facilities, and to resolve all the outstanding issues regarding its initial declaration. The 90-day deadline given to Syria expired on the 7th of October. I reported to the OPCW Executive Council and to all the states parties that Syria has not completed any of the measures I just described. Now, it is up to the conference of the states parties and the Executive Council of the organization to adopt further measures if they decide so, as I mentioned, since 2018, the Secretariat of the OPCW has the authority to investigate in Syria chemical weapons use to identify the perpetrators. However, it is relevant to underline that the Secretariat of the OPCW is neither a public prosecutor nor a court of justice. States parties do have at their disposal, tools and mechanisms to proceed further on the basis of the information they received, including the one provided by the OPCW in its reports identifying the perpetrators. In 2018, a chemical weapon was used in Salisbury and in Amsbury in the United Kingdom. Five individuals were poisoned, one of them fatally. The use of uh, chemical weapons in the last uh, years advised the member states of the OPCW to update the list of the organization containing the most dangerous chemicals. This list is called the Schedule 1. In this vein, two proposals were made to add new, very dangerous chemicals to the group so-called Schedule 1. The conference of the 193 state parties provided, excuse me, approved in November last year the inclusion of those chemicals in the list. It was the first time 
since the entry into force of the convention in 1997, that this list was amended. Unfortunately, the threat is not receding. On the 20th of August this year, a Russian citizen and political activist, Mr. Alexei Navalny, fell seriously ill when he was traveling by plane in Russia. Soon later, Mr. Navalny was brought to Germany for medical treatment. On the 3rd of September, Germany informed the OPCW that it had confirmed that Mr. Navalny had been poisoned and that the poisoning was due to the use of a chemical nerve agent from the so-called family of the Novichoks. Subsequently, the Secretariat of the OPCW received a request for technical assistance from the Federal Republic of Germany. In response to the request, a team of experts from the Secretariat directly and independently collected biosamples from Mr. Navalny for analysis by the OPCW designated laboratories. The results of the analysis by the OPCW designated laboratories confirmed that a toxic chemical of the Novichok family was used to poison Mr. Navalny. According to the Convention for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the poisoning of an individual through the use of a nerve agent is a use of chemical weapon. Whether or not this chemical is included in the Schedule I group I mentioned before. We are nearing the end of the elimination of declared uh, chemical weapons, as I before mentioned. As we are coming to an end of the destruction uh, for all the declared chemical weapons by the state's parties, because less than 2% remain, remain to be destroyed, we run the risk to fall into self-complacency. On this basis, it can be thought that the organization has achieved its goal. But unfortunately, this is not the case. I will openly say that our most difficult task is still ahead because the worst is yet to come. I'm referring to new chemicals that can be used against the central nervous system of the human body. Even milligrams of those chemicals constitute a threat for, interna for the international community. I'm also referring to the technically easy and cheap access to very sensitive information via internet. The internet provides access to vendors technical information, do-it-yourself expertise, on the basis of which people with ill intentions can find the way to acquire chemical precursors and equipment that can be used for evil purposes. Accordingly, our focus in the organization is shifting to the difficult challenge of preventing re-emergence while keeping pace with the rapid evolution of science and technology. We should keep in mind that this organization is not working towards non-proliferation, but rather total elimination, zero tolerance, complete eradication. This is a complex and permanent goal, which also requires engagement with uh, partners in chemical industry academia, governments, parliaments, the judicial, because of the need to enact domestic legislation, to train judges, custom officials, police uh, officials. It uh, requires engagement across governments involving ministries of foreign affairs, defense, industry, trade, education, science, interior, home affairs, etc. Our common goal is to reduce the risk 
of uh, toxic chemicals from being diverted. For instance, manipulating international trade transfers. Manipulated by those who would use them to do harm. As you perhaps know, it's a year of 3.3 trillion euros of chemicals are produced, traded around the world. And this figure is growing. We are surrounded by chemicals. They are an essential part of modern life. They are used in companies working in the food and agricultural industry, for instance, to produce pesticides, fertilizers, etc. In human health, energy production, pigment and cleaning production, manufacturing, uh, and among other things. As a result, dozens of tons of toxic chemicals are produced, transported, stored, traded, and consumed daily for entirely legitimate ends. Still, the risk exists that fractions of uh, these uh, dangerous substances, if diverted with ill intent, can cause serious harm. The verification regime of the OPCW carries out uh, each year over 240 industry inspections all over the world. This is an important contribution to, the, to reduce the risks. A priority of the OPCW is to cooperate with states parties and the chemical industry to ensure chemicals are secure along the entire supply chain from production to distribution. We are also working with states parties to reduce commercial transfer discrepancies to ensure that all traded chemicals are accounted for. Our ability to attract, maintain, and develop a team of high caliber experts in the Secretariat is central to our capacity to prevent the re-emergence of chemical weapons. At present, the OPCW is developing the project of constructing a new center for chemistry and technology. You can see the, the building here in the name, but this is the project. We'll have selected a constructed a constructor in January, and the construction will start next summer. The project design of the building is complete. We have already the necessary budget, and we are respecting the timeline previously established despite the COVID-19 outbreak. The center will include a new laboratory and new premises devoted to international cooperation knowledge and expertise uh, management, scientific research, etc. It will enhance our chemical uh, analytical capacities and our, or, and our knowledge management capacities. To this uh, wonderful project, 21 European Union member st states individually and the European Union have contributed with a total of 15.9 million euros. I essentially thank uh, these contributors for their generous support. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention was uh, signed in a very uh, different uh, period than the one we are now living in. It is the responsibility of its uh, 193 states parties, parties supported by the organization to preserve the convention's achievements and to protect the norm against the use of chemical weapons. In this endeavor, the support it has received from the, U from the European Union member states and the European Union has an immense value. Thank you very much to everybody for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Monsieur the Director General, for these uh, very comprehensive remarks. The OPCW has for several years been at the heart of uh, contemporary arms control issues. And, and, and I believe we can say so. One of the uh, remparts 
of a world uh, ordered and still ordered by the rule of uh, multilateral law. You have recalled uh, the issues of, uh, of concern facing the state's parties at the convention, and, uh, and in particular allegations of use, but also the post-destruction phase, uh, which uh, will be challenging indeed. You also outlined the successes of the organization and of the convention, the constructions, the uh, initiatives on the way, including the uh, investigation and the identification team. Uh, it is 11.53, but we started late, so I hope we can have some time for questions with our friends and, and colleagues uh, in the audience before uh, um, opening the next session. Uh, we have already received questions for you. Uh, uh, well, privilege of the chair, if I may. Uh, may I ask you a specific one uh, uh, also? Can you give, uh, I, I, will, I will ask you two or three questions among those uh, who were uh, proposed, uh, including mine. And mine is a short one. Can you give a bit of a detail about the building which is pictured on, on your left, uh, which is, I believe, a recent uh, construction of uh, the organization. And, and the other questions which at the moment have been asked uh, are one uh, from our good friend Oliver Meyer, which is about the IIT's current mandate. He asks, what steps would be necessary uh, for the IIT to investigate assassination attempt on uh, on Navalny and to um, and 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 uh, in order to help uh, identify perpetrators, of course. Uh, and uh, another question is from uh, Iran uh, Nagan from EEAS in Brussels. Uh, Iran asks in. Um, recent weeks, there were allegations of use of white phosphorus in a conflict, and uh, he would like to know what's the position of the organization on these. Uh, is it seized of, of this uh, matter? And, and we have also, back to Navalny issue, we have also a question from Mr. Krivonos. Uh, could you explain the Russian requirements to provide with details uh, and, and chemical formula? of chemical substance used against Navalny uh, in order to investigate this case. So uh, at the moment, we have these three questions and, and, and the detailed one from me about the pictures behind you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. There is a lot of substance in the four questions, really, that uh, you have uh, asked uh, to me. And the first one is the, the building. The building um, is a... Uh, as a very modern design, the architect is a Dutch architect. It is built in a plot of land of 6,000 square meters, very close to the headquarters in The Hague, 20 minutes by car. Uh, it's, uh, the, the surface of the building is 5,500 square meters. And we, and our goal is to have this building available at the end of 2023 or beginning of 2024. It will have a, a big area for a new and the state-of-the-art laboratory and the big area also for uh, research, development, uh, knowledge management, uh, training, uh, seminars, lectures. Um, at the moment, we are um, uh, in consultation with the member states to prepare a dossier uh, of uh, um, projects to be developed uh, in the building when it will be uh, finished. It, it will be a fantastic uh, tool because the uh, the challenge of this organization is to provide services. We provide services to the member states, and those services have to be mm, mm, of, a, of a excellent quality. And for that, anything related to knowledge and expertise is the total priority of this place where I work. Mm, and the Center for Chemistry and Technology will be a fantastic tool. The second question is related to the Russian requirements uh, for the formula um, of uh, the came of the agent, the chemical agent that was used against Navalny. Um, the rules are the following one. 
and any member state can ask for a technical assistant visit uh, to the um, organization. The organization um, goes there, takes samples and uh, proceeds to analyze the samples, uh, environmental or um, biomedical samples. Those sam samples are analyzed and we produce a report. The report is given to the member states that requires the technical assistant visit. And the member state who gets the report is the owner of the information. In this case, it is Germany. Germany is the owner of the information and only Germany can release part of the information or the, the, the whole of it. And Germany has decided to release almost all the report produced by the by the OPCW related to the Navalny case, but has decided uh, with the uh, um, goal of, uh, of um, with the idea of non-proliferation, not to um, uh, publish the formula, which means that um, Germany will not provide the formula of this extremely dangerous chemical agent to any other country, including Russia. Uh, in connection with um, the pos uh, possible investigation of the um, uh, investigation and identification team in uh, Russia uh, related to uh, the case of Mr. Navalny, I have to say that um, any investigation related uh, to the activities of the IIT um, are uh, contemplated by, uh, by paragraph 20 of the decision of the Conference of States Parties of June 2018. And the paragraph 20 says that um, the IIT uh, can only go to investigate in a certain place upon request of this specific country, which means that in this case, only the IIT could go to Russia and to investigate the, 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 the perpetrators um, upon request of the Russian Federation. And the answer to the third question is, uh, well, thank you very much for this question because it allows me um, to explain something um, that, um, that means a, a lot of confusion in the media in, 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 in recent days. And, uh, and it is a normal thing, the white phosphorus. White phosphorus um, is a weapon. This weapon um, allegedly has been used re recently uh, in the conflict uh, in the conflict in Naborno Karabakh, but uh, it is allegedly used. Wet phosphorus is a chemical, but is never used as a chemical weapon because white phosphorus is very unstable, and uh, a, chemi a, 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 a chemical um, used as a chemical weapon has to be used for um, its toxicity, toxicity. When a chemical is used for in, in a different form, it is not a chemical weapon. And in the case of white phosphorus, um, this, uh, this uh, chemical is used for producing smoke, um, for producing a lot of light, or as an incendiary weapon, which means it is not used as a chemical weapon because its toxicity doesn't count when it is used as um, an incendiary weapon or produ for producing smoke um, or, um, as, uh, or for producing light. And it falls under the, under the 1980 convention uh, called Convention about Certain Conventional Weapons, which means that the OPCW has not the authority to send a team to the area to investigate the alleged use of white phosphorus. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Director General Arias. Uh, if, if you wish, uh, we can have maybe one other question because our uh, colleague and good friend Raphael Prenat would like uh, to hear you about two specific points. Uh, the first one is uh, related to non-state actors. Uh, Rafael asks, what are the initiatives engaged by OPCW to address the issues related to the threat of chemical use by non-state actors? And his second one 
uh, which is uh, an optimistic one, uh, Raphael, is, uh, is OPCW work with other uh, partners to be ready in case of disarmament process in DPRK. Uh, but still, I think it is a very good one since uh, uh, this uh, DPRK file is always uh, um, uh, touched uh, about uh, the, on the nuclear side. Uh, and it is, of course, uh, also relevant uh, uh, in the chemical realm. Uh, thank you, uh, Monsieur le Directeur Général. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Non-state actors. Non-state actors are related mainly to uh, terrorism. Terrorism uh, linked to um, certain chemicals is a, or are a real threat for international uh, peace and international community. We have a working group on the terrorism. We are progressing well. Um, the OPCW is not an anti-terrorist organization, but we cooperate actively with uh, other international organizations, mainly with the United Nations, um, to give information. And our cooperation uh, is uh, specified in the activities we have uh, related to inspections. The inspections reduce the risk of any diversion of uh, chemicals so that uh, we make it more difficult the chemicals to fall in the wrong hands. We have uh, friendly relations with the chemical industry and the chemical industry accepts our mm, inspections mm, that are, mm, well, this year, under a very strong pressure because of the of the of the pandemic, um, inspections uh, mean to travel all over the world, and my people are traveling on the, on a weekly basis all over the world to inspect the chemical industries. But lately, um, it has become much more difficult. Um, we are very active in seminars, and um, we work to create awareness. We make efforts for outreaching young people, scientists, politicians, so that this awareness of the real danger that some chemicals can mean. Of course, some people say that uh, so far terrorists uh, prefer to use the classic uh, um, weapons because they are easy uh, to uh, purchase and easy to manipulate. Um, the general rule is this one, but we cannot discard that certain uh, groups uh, can decide uh, to use chemical weapons, as in Japan, the group uh, so-called Aum Shiriko did uh, several years ago, using sarin. Um, we have to say that our cooperation uh, with uh, uh, Interpol, uh, with, uh, the, with the European Union, with uh, the agencies of the United Nations related to uh, anti-terrorist activities is very satisfactory and we are always available to uh, exchange information with them and we will go on like that. The, mm, well, no, North Korea. As uh, you know, uh, the war in Syria and the access uh, of the Syrian Republic to the OPCW has uh, been uh, the most difficult dossier we ever had and still have. And this is the origin of the most unpleasant and destructive moments in the organization in the last few years because there is a big confrontation in the policy making organs between the, the big powers because of the war in Syria. Um, the, as I said uh, in my little statement, the Syrian declaration of the chemical weapons it possessed is not by far complete after more than, well, more than six years already. And the lesson learned is that we must not fall in the same mistakes or problems uh, we had to face when one day uh, the, 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 the North Korea or another country will be a member of the organization. To be a member of the organization is something automatic. Upon request, the 
country becomes a member and it has to follow the rules. We have uh, worked already uh, quite a long time ago um, in, um, in setting up a team uh, to study the lessons learned uh, related to Syria um, and uh, to um, be ready with uh, better or more modern work working methods uh, to um, prevent, uh, the, the, to repeat the same problems we have been having um, with the Syrian Arab Republic that has had that meant not only um, confrontations, but also the use of um, a very important amount of um, public money and many hours of uh, work of our teams. Um, to give you an example, we have been already 23 times uh, with our team in the Syrian Arab Republic um, in rounds of consultations to um, clarify to complete the Syrian declaration. We have been working in those 23 rounds of consultations in Syria for already more than six years, and the declaration is not yet complete. We don't want to have a new edition of that with any other new member. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director General. Well understood uh, this last point. And, uh, and, and, and thank you for your very detailed answers to, uh, to our colleague, Rafael Fennar. We have other questions to you, but it is unfortunately time to put an end to this uh, very uh, enriching and, and precise exchange on your part and, and on the part of our good colleagues. So uh, I have to say thank you very much, uh, Director General, for making yourself available and, 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 uh, and so uh, uh, specific in your answers uh, for our uh, conference. It's a great honor to participate in this reunion. Thank you very much for inviting me. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur Général. I propose that we take a five minutes break uh, before starting the next session, which uh, will be devoted to the implementation of the EU's non-proliferation and disarmament agenda with four very distinguished speakers. Thank you to all of you. <laughs>